thank you all for being here today. My name is Stephen Fagan, and uh, as Sharon said, I'm the oral historian here at the Sixth Form Museum. One of the challenges that I face as I go out and talk to these people who were involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the aftermath is trying to ask questions that will be important a hundred years from now when we hope that researchers and students and historians will be watching these oral history videos that the museum is producing. And people like Paul Bentley agree to interviews and I ask them very detailed questions to try to get the story straight to find out what their participation was and how they were feeling at the time that this occurred. Because the Kennedy assassination this November will be 45 years ago and there will come a day when there's no one left around that was alive at the time that this happened. So it's important that we preserve these memories while we still have folks like Mr. Bentley here to share them with us. And so today's presentation is being recorded. It will become a part of the oral history collection here at the museum. Paul and I are going to talk for a while and then I'm going to let you guys become oral historians. So as you sit there and listen to the presentation today, think about questions that might be relevant, questions that might be important to people 50 or 100 years from now. And you'll have the chance to ask those questions in just a little bit. Paul, thanks for being here with us today. Stephen, it's always a pleasure to be here with you, and especially to see all these fine, good-looking young people. <laughs> well, great. Now, at the time of the assassination, you were a detective, and you were the chief of the polygraph division? I was, yes. And what was your assignment the day the president came to Dallas? Uh, I was the polygraph chief of the polygraph examiner Polygraph, of course, is a lie detector, in case you don't know exactly what it was. I was on polygraph for quite some time, but we found that found out that President Kennedy and his associates were coming to Dallas. We were thrilled, very thrilled. I was asked to step just across the street at Harwood and Main Streets for crowd control when the procession was due to come by, come down Harwood Street, turn right on Main Street, just across the street from City Hall. I was assigned that corner as the procession went by. What was it like to see President and Mrs. Kennedy in person there in the car? Oh, it was terrific. Uh, they were so very, very happy, along with Governor and Mrs. Connolly in the same car. Uh, as they went by, I was close enough to reach out and actually touch Mrs. Kennedy. I did not, but I was close enough to where I could touch her. She was thrilled, and that she looked right at me and smiled just as beautifully as she always has. What were the crowds like? Were they enthusiastic? Very definitely, Stephen. The crowd was just thrilled. Uh, you could hardly hear anything with all the roar from the crowd as the procession went by. Uh, people, after the procession passed Maine and Harwood, which is at, right near the city hall, uh, the crowd began to disperse, but a lot of people stood around talking. A lot of people uh, knew who I was and asked questions uh, about the police department and different things. and. Again, they were also very happy that our president had come to Dallas, uh, which he was advised not to come to Dallas, but he was happy to come to Dallas. So what happened to you after the motorcade passed by? What was your duties after that? Okay, I went back into the city hall. I have an office in the basement of the city hall. I went back to the city hall and uh, to perform my regular duties. Uh, I was not busy at that particular time, and. Captain George Dowdy, who was a captain of the Identification Bureau, just happened to pass and said, Paul, we just got a report that President Kennedy had been shot. I said, oh, come on, Captain, you're kidding me. He said, no, the president had just been shot. Well, naturally, I felt, as most everybody else was feeling, very sad at that particular time, and I was asking different questions as to what had actually happened. And uh, very few of the men that came in at that time knew what had happened because they were not at the school book depository. Uh, finally, uh, we did talk to one man that came up to Captain Fritz's office, who was in charge of the Homicide and Robbery Bureau, and he explained that the shots had been fired from the sixth floor of the school book depository. Now, when did you hear that a Dallas police officer, J.D. Tippett, had been shot? Okay, uh, the same captain, Captain Dowdy, uh, passed my office going into the crime scene search section and as he passed he said Paul J.D. Tipp has just been shot and I said where did all this happen he said an old cliff he said we're going out to print the patrol car I said good let me go with you so I went with Captain Dowdy and George uh, uh, Pete Barnes who was the identification fingerprint expert and uh, we went to the scene 10th and Bishop which is just right back over here uh, where Tippett had been shot. 
Now, at the time, did you make the connection between the shooting of this police officer and the shooting of the president? No. Actually, the shooting of the police officer to us was altogether a different situation. At that particular time, we had no knowledge whatsoever that the person that had shot Officer Tippett had just shot President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly. We have a picture from the crime scene at the Tippett shooting, which was at the corner of 10th and Patton in Oak Cliff. Uh, Corey, can we see that first picture? What are we looking at, Paul? Well, that's Officer Tippett's patrol car as Oswald was walking east on Patton Street, on 10th Street, the patrol car pulled up close to the curb and asked him to come over to the window, the passenger's window of the patrol car. As he came over to the window, he leaned up on the patrol car, putting his hands on the seal of the window, talking to Officer Tippett. Officer Tippett was not satisfied with the information he got from him talking to him in that particular location. So he asked him to come around to the front of the patrol car. Officer Tippett got out on this side of the patrol car, came around to meet Oswald. As he got to the left front fender, Oswald pulled a pistol and shot Officer Tippett three times. And as he fell, he shot him in the head the fourth time. He then ran between two houses. A uh, young fellow working in the yard bumped into him on this particular house right back on the right over here as he was reloading his pistol, ran across the parking lot, a used car parking lot, going towards the Texas Theater on Jefferson Street. Now the gentleman there wearing the bow tie, you see him, he was uh, part of the crime lab? That was Pete Barnes. He had just printed the right window seal there, the door of the patrol car, getting some fingerprints off of the patrol car. Now, the polygraph division, that was part of the crime scene search unit? Right. It was a part of a search unit. That was CSI back in 1963. You've seen the TV series CSI, so Mr. Bentley would have been part of that division at the Dallas Police Department in the early 60s. Now, a, a crime scene like this, Paul, tell us a little bit about how they would gather evidence at a scene like this. Well, we had it on, at that particular scene, not only was Captain Dowdy there, who was in charge of the Demarcation Bureau, but we had FBI, Secret Service, and various other officers there. Uh, Captain Westbrook was charged with gaining evidence at the scene. Uh, two or three officers were assigned to pick up evidence at the scene and report it back to the police department. Now, while you were there at the scene, you got word of a, of a suspicious individual. Tell us that story. I had talked to a lady who was a witness of the crime and sitting on the front porch just across the street from the patrol car. I had finished talking with her when a captain in charge of the patrol division came over to me and said, Paul, we've looked everywhere for Oswald, but we just got a report that a suspect had been seen entering the Texas theater, that he ran in the theater without paying. And what had actually happened, Steve, is after he ran through the parking lot over to Jefferson Street and discarded the jacket that he had on and dropped on the parking lot, he went up Ref uh, Jefferson Street, stopped. A lot of patrol cars were looking for the suspect, but he stopped at the store, shoe store right next to the Texas Theater. As a patrol car slowed, he stepped inside. The manager asked him if he could help him. He didn't say a word, but ran out and then ran into the Texas Theater without paying. And that's when uh, Captain Talbert asked me to go with him to the Texas Theater. He said, I'll let you out in the front, and I'll go to the back and meet the officers, and we'll come in from the back entrance. Let me stop you there. Let's take a look at the, uh, the front of the Texas Theater as it looked at the time of the assassination. Corey, the next slide, please. There we are, and that's the, that's the marquee, I believe, as it was that day. There right. was a, a film called War is Hell that was being shown when Oswald snuck into the theater without buying a ticket. Is that pretty much the way the theater looked when you saw it? That, that is exactly the way it looked, and I'll tell you a little story about the Texas Theater. You might get a kick out of this. I lived with my grandmother in Oak Cliff back when I was only about 10 or 12 years old. I used to go to the Texas Theater on Saturdays because they had a Mickey Mouse committee and program every Saturday morning at the Texas Theater. For some reason or another, I was elected Chief Mickey Mouse. That's the only time, other time I was in the Texas Theater until I went in to find Oswald. Wow, that's a story that didn't make it into our previous right. oral histories together, so I'm glad you told us that. Okay, so you got dropped off in the front of the theater, and what did you do after that? 
uh, as I entered the theater, I approached the ticket taker and she said, this young man ran in without paying, has gone up into the balcony, and we've been listening to the radio, and we think he's the one that shot President Kennedy. I said, it, was he armed? And she said, I don't know, I didn't see a gun. So he went to the balcony. So I immediately went to the mezzanine, where we had several officers in the restroom. I pulled my revolver and checked each office in each restroom, and nobody was in any particular any office on the, in the mezzanine, so I went on to the balcony. As I climbed the stairs and made my turn with the gun in my hand, I could see that we only had about six or seven young people in the balcony. I immediately went to the projectionist and identified myself and asked him to turn on all house lights. By that time, officers were coming in from the stage entrance. They had Captain Talbot had met him in the back and were coming in from the stage entrance. And one of them was Officer Nick McDonald. Uh, they proceeded to come in. I could not find him in the balcony, so I immediately went back over to the other side of the balcony and down the stairs. Let's see the next picture if we can, Corey. This shows us the inside of the theater. Do you know who that officer is, Paul? No, I, I really don't know. He, uh, this was taken a few days after the assassination. I'm not sure who he was. Yeah, this He's is actually, actually over a little too far from the seat where Oswald was sitting. Oswald was sitting in the seat back this way. Okay, but is the same row, the, the row he's touching there, was that right. row just a few seats to it'd be your, your left on that side? Uh, the one that has the rip and the cushion, you think that might, may have been the seat That's or the one next to it? That, that one or the one to the right of it. Okay. But that was the row there towards the back of the theater. Right. This is actually a Dallas police crime scene photograph. This would have been taken by the, uh, the crime scene folks at the Dallas Police Department. So this is where you first saw Oswald seated? Right. That was where Oswald was seated. And as I came down, Officer McDonald and several other officers were checking people in the theater. Actually, the manager had met what, uh, Officer McDonald as he entered and pointed out this suspect. Uh, lady and a small boy was sitting just about two seats over from where that officer was sitting. As Mac went up to check people in certain rows, he knew he was looking for the suspect because the manager had pointed him out, but he did not immediately go to the suspect. He did ask the people to the left of the suspect if they would get up and move. They moved and he stepped in the row. He was in the row in front of Oswald. As he came up in front of Oswald, Oswald immediately jumped up. Uh, Officer McDonald asked him to stand. As he stood, he pulled the pistol out of his waist, uh, actually to shoot McDonald. But as he pulled the pistol out, he hit McDonald, as you'll see in just a few minutes. You want to show that? Yeah, we'll show the next picture, please. This is uh, Officer M. Nick McDonald. There he is right there. And if you look on his cheek, right around where his hair, all the way down to his mouth. You see that long scratch on his face? See that? That's what happened when, uh, when Oswald hit him in the face there. It actually knocked his cap off. Right. He, uh, he was the first officer to approach McDonald. I came in from the row on the right over here, and as uh, Oswald hit McDonald, I immediately dove over two of those rows of seats. I did not know at the time I dove over the seats, I hung my right ankle in between the rows of seats, and in scuffling with Oswald, I pulled the ligaments in my right ankle. But by the time he hit Mac, both Mac and I grabbed for the pistol. He had the pistol in his hand, he had it cocked, and he had pressed the hammer, but it so happened that one of us got our hand, our finger, our thumb in between the hammer and the firing pin, and only showed a slight intention on the shell, and we saved McDonald from being shot. And so then, by that time, you had several other officers that were starting to approach Oswald. Right. We had probably six or seven other officers that were in the, the rows coming up from the stage entrance. And they all, of course, as the scuffle took place, came over and assisted. And Oswald was arrested, put handcuffs put on him after he was fighting like a tiger. But we did get handcuffs on him. and immediately took him out of the theater. Let's see this last picture. This is our last image. It's in color. And uh, that handsome fellow with the cigar hanging out of his mouth, that is Paul Bentley, who's here with us today. And that's just a, a wonderful picture. That's the first picture taken of Oswald as he is being arrested. 
So at this moment, Paul, you're smiling. Tell us why you're smiling there. Well, first of all, I want you to know that 45 years ago, I had black hair and quite a bit more hair. Uh, I was in my late 40s at that time. But anyway, on my right is Officer C.L. Walker, who also assisted me as we took uh, Oswald up from the floor, handcuffed him to take him outside. They told me, uh, and back years and years ago, I used to chew on a cigar. You see a little cigar in my mouth. Before that was taken, I said, I did not have a cigar in my mouth. I would have bitten it in two, scuffling with, my, with uh, Oswald. But there it is. He said, you sure still had the slub of a cigar in your mouth. But when, I, when we got Oswald out of the theater, this is just before we got to the car to place him in the car to bring him to City Hall, he was saying, oh, those handcuffs are too tight. And I turned to Walker and I said, Walker, would you mind check, checking the handcuffs? And the reason I'm smiling, he came back and said, Paul, I just tightened them. <laughs> Now, what else had Oswald said from the moment you pounced on him in the theater to when you dragged him out? What was he saying during that police time? Police brutality. Police brutality. He's hollering, police brutality. Nobody hit him. Uh, I did come down on the side of Oswald. I scraped the side of his head. Uh, you can't see it there, but I had a little skin under the, off of his forehead on this ring here. But nobody, and there was officers with shotguns that... Uh, he claimed was hit with shotgun butts, but he was not, as you can see in this picture, he was not hit with a shotgun butt. The only time he was hit or scraped is when I was grabbing f to get a hold of the gun and grabbed, uh, came down on the side of him. Now, was there a crowd outside the theater when you um, brought him out? Very large crowd had gathered there, along with quite a few police officers that uh, had congregated in front of the theater. The crowd was very disturbed over the assassination of the president. At that particular time, we did not know that we had arrested the suspect assassination of the president. We knew we had arrested the suspect in the killing of Officer Tippett. He was placed in a patrol car, unmarked patrol car that was sitting in the front of the theater. We had to, first we wanted to put him in on the curbside, but the crowd was beginning to curse quite a bit. And, wanted to get a hold of Oswald, so we had to take him in and put him in from the street side of the car. I got in the back seat beside of him. Detective Lyons was on the right side of him. As we proceeded towards the city hall, uh, the police dispatcher came on the radio and wanted to know who our suspect was. And I immediately had the wallet in my hand and I took out a different identifications. He had several different aliases. And, I, that, and they said, after I told them it was Lee Harvey Oswald, they said, bring him up directly to Captain Fritz, who's in homicide. He is a prime suspect in the assassination of President Kennedy and the wounding of Governor Connolly. I turned to him and I said, did you just kill our president? He said, I am shot a down person. And that's the last he ever said to me. And when was the last time you saw Oswald in person? Uh, I was at Captain Fritz's office for just a short time on that same day that we arrested him. And then uh, I went over to uh, the personnel office to write a report, and the inspector came over and happened to look at my right foot and said, Paul, what's wrong with your right ankle? Uh, I, did, I said, nothing. And I looked down, I couldn't see my shoe because the ankle had swollen so bad. So they immediately placed me in a patrol car and took me to Baylor Hospital and put it in a cast. And you were on crutches the rest of that weekend, right? I was on crutches. In fact, my wife knew that I was in good shape and knew I wasn't anywhere, anywhere around assassination because I had an office at the city hall and I wouldn't be out on patrol or anything, and she was happy she could be. But when she saw this patrol car pull up in front of the house and me getting out with my leg all banished up in a cast, she said, what in the world's happened to you? <laughs> I said, I was in on the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. If it happened in Dallas, you're going to be involved in it. <laughs> I'll repeat the question. What effects has the assassination had on your life uh, since that time? I would say that the, the, the fact that I have been uh, up until probably the last year or so, I've been 
uh, extremely busy uh, in making presentations and talks to school children, to church groups, to so many people that uh, I retired from the Dallas Police Department in 1968 and went to First National Bank here in Dallas as Director of Security. I remained there for 11 years and then went with a as an executive vice president of a security organization. And during all this time, I was called on many times by people as far as Alaska. I've been to Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been to so many different places to make talks and to see and talk to uh, different officials. Uh, uh, in answer to your question, I, uh, you know, I'm just surprised that I seem to be popular. I never thought I'd be popular, but <laughs> so many people want want me to come talk to them, and I, I have gone to so many, many church organizations, and I, I love to go to church organizations and talk to Sunday school classes, church groups, and I never charge a dime to go visit with them and explain my part in the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald. I, 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 love, I love to talk to people. Right. Other questions? Yes, sir. How did you feel after the arrest of Oswald? Well, I was extremely nervous. Uh, the thing that worried me was that, that if that pistol had gone off, it would have been in the stomach of, of uh, Nick McDonald. And I certainly was extremely nervous. The fact that he would not answer our questions when I asked him if he shot the president, uh, of course his answer, as I told you what he said, but. Uh, uh, I was extremely nervous. In fact, when I sat down to write the report, uh, I was doing good to be able to write because I was still nervous. Uh, the fact that I had been involved in it and possibly helping to save the life of a fellow officer, uh, I, just, I, I just felt real good. I bet this was a pretty tremendous day. Not only had the president been shot and the governor of Texas wounded right here after you had seen them, but then one of your fellow officers had been shot and killed, and then all of this was happening. What kind of an impact did this have on the police department as a whole? Certainly with the killing of Officer Tippett, the police department was extremely upset. Uh, the Dallas Police Department was criticized uh, uh, I guess by many, many people because they say we allowed President Kennedy to be shot. Uh, I'll assure you we did not, but the Dallas Police Department was criticized. At that particular time, now this is in 1963, uh, we didn't have but approximately five, six hundred Dallas police officers, maybe seven hundred by that time. Uh, now there's well over two or three thousand. But uh, the police department was Jess Curry was our chief of police, extremely good police officer, and extremely good man. Uh, was really upset because the criticism that we received, many, many letters. Uh, I did receive lots of letters of congratulations, but I also received some letters critical of the president and Governor Connolly being shot. Hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned earlier that he was advised not to come to Dallas. Could you elaborate on that? Tell us more about Kennedy being advised not to come to Dallas that day. Adley Stevens, several months prior to that, was a senator, was uh, in Dallas making a presentation and was spit on time or two by people that were upset with uh, Kennedy's regime. Uh, Kennedy was a wonderful man. Uh, in my opinion, was one of the best presidents that we ever had. Had a wonderful family. Uh, I think Kennedy definitely wanted to come to Dallas, and it so happened he was making his first talk in Fort Worth that particular morning, and it had been raining. The limousine that he rides in is carried in on Air Force One, and it was taken off uh, in Fort Worth, and uh, it was raining while he was there. They flew into Love Field, landed, and got off of the plane. He went over and shook hands with Mrs. Kennedy, and the rain began to stop. He advised the Secret Service to lower the top of that particular car and have it open so he could see people and shake hands with people. 
That's the only way that Oswald could have shot him was if the top had been up, it had never been able to shot him, shoot him, but the rain had stopped and he ordered the top taken down. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, how did you feel when you let Oswald get shot? Where were you and, and what were you feeling when Jack Ruby shot Oswald on Sunday? I was at home. Uh, my leg was in the cast. I was watching that on TV and uh, I guess to be very frank with you, I was happy. Uh, Oswald shooting Officer Tippett, certainly I was upset. But if you recall, as Oswald was brought out of the city jail, he was brought out by Detective Lavelle and Detective L.C. Graves. L.C. Graves was the man that took the pistol away from Jack Ruby. L.C. Graves is my wife's brother-in-law, my, my brother-in-law. My wife's sister married L.C. Graves. L.C. Graves was a prominent detective, a very good detective, but he did take the pistol away from uh, Ruby. Oswald, Ruby was subdued because there was lots of officers. As he brought him out of the basement of City Hall, there was lots of officers there. Other questions? Yes, way in the back there. Paul, what do you think of the uh, conspiracy theories about Oswald and the president's assassination? It's a lot of baloney. <laughs> there's no conspiracy, in my opinion, uh, young people, there's no conspiracy whatsoever. Oswald acted alone. I have researched Oswald since he was two years of age. You've got to know Oswald and Oswald's mother to try to put all this together. But in my opinion, Steve, there's no conspiracy whatsoever. And, and that you've kept that opinion for over 45, almost 45 years now? I certainly have, and it's always in police work when something like this happens and one or more people are involved in it sooner or later, somebody is going to tell about it. And if there was conspiracy, 45 years, a long time, somebody would have come forward and we would know that there was conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have any opinions on Oswald's motive for shooting President Kennedy? I really don't have anything definite. Uh, we could never actually come up with a definite reason why he picked Ken brother, uh, President Kennedy. The only thing is that Oswald was upset because of the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, and that was ordered by President uh, Kennedy. and. Uh, Oswald was in the military and asked for a change in discharge and at that time Governor Connolly was secretary of, of the uh, military and he refused to do that so we, we just put what we hear two and two together I, I, I really don't know. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Bentley? Anybody on this side of the room? No? Any other questions over here? This is your one chance. Yes. Had, had Oswald lived longer, had he not been shot by Ruby, do you think he would have confessed or given any information? I think he would have, I don't think he would have confessed, but he would have been convicted because we had all the evidence that we needed. Uh, I wish he had, had lived so that we could have taken him to court. All right. Oh, last question. Yes. I'm sorry, say, repeat that. If he had lived and gone to trial and had been convicted, as you suggest, do you have any ideas to what um, what the uh, verdict would have been and, and what what would have happened to Oswald? Uh, uh, it would only be a, a thought that if he had been convicted, certainly he would have given the, been given the death penalty. I would think. I, I don't know what a jury may have done, but. Uh, he certainly would have deserved to receive the death penalty. Okay. Well, we breeze through that half hour. Sharon, do you have any comments? Um, if everyone in this room could just join me in thanking uh, Detective um, Bentley for being with us this morning, just amazing. So, will you join me in thanking the detective? <laughs>